I think this is a place where people get real. This is a place where people come for community and for nature, connection with nature. Coming here and not knowing the language and not knowing the culture and being nothing, in a sense, has taught me a lot of humility and sensitivity and taught me the importance of seeing how things are here and, and not assuming I know. Very agricultural place. And I, I don't believe in the distinction of natural versus not natural, but insofar as we use words to make that distinction, the culture here is natural. People are relaxed. They're in the moment. Mm -hmm. the, the downside of that is if you make... Hello and welcome back to the channel. Jesse Bayer. This is... Well, actually, before I even get into that, before we even start, hit the like button right now. Do us a favor. Help us. I already got my guest giggling. Um, do us a favor. Help us out with the algorithm. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the like button. Uh, hit the bell as well so you're notified with new content. But I am pleased to be joined today by Ryman Bledsoe. This is part of our ongoing Expat Life Ecuador series, uh, where we're really trying to give you guys a firsthand look at people's experiences who live in the Vilcabamba region, the Loja region of Ecuador, share their story, and uh, you know, and just chat. So again, I'm joined today by Ryman Bledsoe. Ryman, I appreciate you taking the time to do this. Uh, if you folks recognize the face, Ryman is a two-time participant of Survivor, of the Survivor TV show, obviously a super popular show uh, for many, many years. Is Survivor still going on? Still going. Still yeah. going. So Ryman finished fourth once, tied for second once, so probably millions and millions of people have seen you. Um, so if you recognize Ryman, that's, uh, that's where you probably recognize him from. Um, so yeah, let's, let's jump right into your story. So you know, if, if you don't mind, let's do a couple of minutes just on background, kind of where you grew up, where you're from, what, you know, what, what did your life entail prior to your, your new life in Ecuador? Yeah, it entailed a lot of things, many different chapters. My full name is Spencer Ryman Bledsoe, so on Survivor I was Spencer. Okay. As a kid, I was Spencer. I was a very studious kid, introverted, traumatized, like everybody in this world. Yep. And uh, so I found outlets and and refuges in chess, in the mind. Big chess player, really into math, really academic, went to a good school, studied economics, became an options trader. Oh, wow. Yeah, former life uh, as an options trader and uh, really focused on making money. And then at a certain point, I realized like, wow, I'm pretty fucked up. Can I curse? Yeah. Okay, and better not to? Better not to, but okay. it's not, yeah, not the end of the world. Okay, I realized I'm a, you know, pretty tweaked in the mind, pretty neurotic, and maybe I should talk about that and try to figure it out. Maybe other people can understand themselves better as I'm vulnerable and share that stuff. So I started a podcast about mental health and mental disorder called Redeeming Disorder. Okay. And I was doing that as I was an option trader for a while and eventually just realized, like, what am I doing? I'm a cog in a machine here doing something another guy could do just as well, but another guy isn't going to do this podcast about mental health. So then I went full time into creative work, podcasting, and uh, through the fulfillment of doing that, and then through the introspection of experiences like Survivor, I started asking a lot of questions about what I wanted to do in life, what I wanted out of life, what life is about, existential questions like a lot of people here ask. And then I had a chapter of uh, being pretty obsessively focused on spiritual development and retreats. So meditation retreats, and then plant medicine retreats. That's what first brought me to Ecuador. Mm -hmm. I went on an ayahuasca retreat in uh, the jungle by Tena. Mm -hmm. I should say plant medicine retreat because there are a lot of other medicines. Um, but yeah, I went there and had the most difficult experience of my life by just orders of magnitude. You know, the second hardest experience of my life, including starving on Survivor, was probably 1% as hard as this one ayahuasca journey. <sighs> Ripped me apart. It can be pretty confrontational, those things. Yeah. I mean, it gives you what you need and it gives you what you're ready for. And I'd already had some big experiences like dying and stuff. And I was like, all right, I've had those experiences. There's nothing to be afraid of. I'm good. And then found out, no. You um, mean like NDE type experience? No, I mean like dying. Like in Guatemala with ayahuasca, I had an experience oh. where I was, yeah, like dealing with my neurotic stuff and my ego. It was all coming to the fore. And then I was trying to hold on, trying to hold on, couldn't hold on. And the room started shaking. The boundaries started blurring. The lines went away. And then it was just implosion of blackness and no 
world, no self, no other, dead, understood what that is. And wow. Yeah, this is a little bit of a digression, but I'll make sure. my way back. Sure. Um, it was 42 days, 40, 45 days, something after my dad had died. Mm. And that's a very hard thing for a man. And so in that experience, I understood, you know, death. We think it's this terrible thing. We have this bias as living creatures to think death bad, but it's not. It's actually awesome. It's probably the best experience of my life. And then I understood, like, my dad is free from the suffering that was characterizing his final years. And, uh, and also all my fears in this world are so silly because this is a world. Right. And it's not necessary to, to be so attached and so worried about it. It is a blessing to be alive. So then I came back. It was like rebirth. And for 30 minutes, I had no thoughts. I had no mind activity. I was a baby. And I was just rediscovering what it is to be in a human body, feeling my face, just, you know, everything's magic, which is how we can live and how we can be insofar as we transcend the ego. And of course, the ego came roaring back as it does. Right. But uh, yeah, that experience was powerful. And so I experienced that. And then I got a spiritual ego from that, of like, <laughs> <laughs> which is a real problem, yeah, yeah. especially places like here. Um, and so I'm like, all right, I've died. There's nothing to be afraid of. And then ayahuasca showed me, no, like there are far worse experiences than death. And uh, look, this life you're living in Southern California is insane. You're locked in a house during this uh, pandemic and your social life is 95 to 100 percent just this girlfriend like you don't you're not connected to people you're not connected to your food to the land to anything other than your mind and this this one person and this is an insane way to live and this is not tenable and so the ego that i had going at the time just had to be destroyed and uh you know then I picked back, picked the pieces back up. You got to fall apart before you can be put back together, I guess. And realized I needed to come here and change my life 100%. So all the characters, all the scenes, all the everything in my life changed. I moved here. I spent about the first year here still falling apart and just letting go of things I carried with me from the U.S. And then spent another year here connecting with people. Had a beautiful relationship with an Ecuadorian woman and met a lot of friends, got connected. And now, finally, I'm doing what I thought I was going to be doing when I first came. But after two and a half years, I'm uh, taking action and building businesses and making a documentary series. And I understand my purpose. I don't really need the medicine so much anymore, for now at least. And uh, so, yeah, that's been my very complicated, long-winded landing here in Vilcabamba. Very cool. So you did you grow up in Southern California? No, Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. Atlanta, Georgia, and then a decade in Chicago. 18 to 28 and then a year or so in California. Okay. So yeah, I was going to say, cause you're pretty young. So you had kind of your time where you're figuring out sort of the matrix world is not what you're looking for. That was in your mid twenties or even early twenties. It was in many degrees and steps. I mean, there were seeds of it in my early twenties. Like when I was on survivor and I was starving, I started realizing like repressed memories and emotions came up and I realized the ego I had together was not as together as I thought. So then I started introspecting and digging and I was digging through my twenties, but really, um, it wasn't until 2020 that I, I really saw and I, <laughs> I realized things are not what they appear. Yeah. That's interesting. I, I almost feel like for folks that kind of live that path of what they would people would describe as awakening there's almost windows that open up it's like 2012 was one people say kind of 2001 was another 2020 was another so that was so the 2020 was kind of your your window interesting oh, good yeah. oh no i was just gonna say i think that was maybe the most significant one and the one like it was like trickling in and i'm sure you saw it being here a long time maybe you weren't here in 2001 no but 2001 or the financial collapse of 809, 2012. Right. Some people come, some people come, some people come. But now I feel like the the dam has broken. And a lot of people are like, if anyone is gonna wake up, I think the last few years is, is the time for that. Yeah. Interesting. So, okay. So you had been, you had been to Tenna sometime previously before you moved here. So therefore Ecuador was on your radar and then, and then decided eventually to move back about two and a half years ago. Yeah, so it was three years ago, January 2021, I went to Tenna, and then I did come to Vilcabamba then. I went okay. and stayed with Maya Choi, yeah. who I think you interviewed too. Yeah. 
And uh, yeah, I got to know her and I got a little bit of a feeling for this place, not a lot, um, just like five days or so and liked it. And then that summer, just five months later, took the leap and, and moved. Okay. Um, and so, so yeah, so interesting. So two and a half years in Vilcabamba approximately. Um, you know, you've, you've bought some property here. As you mentioned, you've kind of ingrained into the community, made a bunch of friends. Like, what is this place? What's this place all about? You know, what, what would you say about this town? <laughs> big question. Yeah, it's a big question. <laughs> it's all perspective. I yeah. think if you look at it one way, it's the Bethlehem of the New Earth. If you look at it another way, it's an open air insane asylum. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. That's great. I stole that. Other people say that, but yeah. it's, it's true. I mean, I think this is a place where people get real. This is a place where people come for community and for nature, connection with nature. We are nature, so it's a little silly when we say connect with nature, but whatever. Connect with the earth, connect with our food, you yeah. know, get sovereign, get, uh, get into our power as human beings and get authentic. And so I think everyone here is on a journey of authenticity. And that means unpacking a lot of stuff that we didn't even know was there. And it looks pretty kooky in a lot of cases. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of people It gets are, messy. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, it's good to understand, like, this is an inspirational place. It's also a pretty crazy place. A lot of people are very lost. And uh, it's uh, like something like a portal or a vortex where people find their way. But I do believe in that bright future. I believe this is a place where we have the space to co-create a way of life that's in harmony with nature, in harmony with our brothers and sisters, and uh, full of peace and freedom. That's that's beautiful words. I, I of course agree. Um, yeah, and it does. It's interesting because you know I I, I agree. Like I think Vilcabamba energetically, you know, and we could attribute this to a million things, but energetically, it's a very intense place. Um, you know, you kind of you kind of I I sort of describe it as you sort of have to face yourself, kind of living here, and so. That can be a great catalyst for growth and for evolution and all that sort of stuff. It can also kick your ass, right? It can also, like, I've seen people kind of come here and sort of just kind of burn up and crash and run, run away, you know, as well, um, which is totally cool. Like, it's, it's not for everyone, but it does, seem to, it does seem to have an extra level of sort of intensity and almost confrontation in whatever process you're in. So I think there are a lot of sort of seekers who find their way here to be in that, in that sort of energy or that sort of situation where they are almost assisted slash forced to kind of, <laughs> you know, look at themselves or process things or confront themselves. Yeah. So that's kind of in your experience, it sounds like as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's been all of that. It's been both. It's been a catalyst for growth, but the growth has been, you know, not a linear path up and up. It's been a path into my shadows and it's been a path of uh, being broken down and struggling with addiction, struggling with uh, these deep wounds that I couldn't even apprehend back in the U.S. Like I think a lot of the developed world is just like a big trauma soup. Yeah. And when, when yeah. you're in a trauma soup, you're the frog in boiling water who doesn't even realize you're getting to the boiling point and you're also coping. So you put your strongest face on and you power through that and you don't realize how vulnerable you are or how weak you are. When I first came here, I was really weak and I was really attached to the U.S. and I wanted to go back to the U.S. and I had a, a dream. I wasn't thinking I would be drinking ayahuasca anymore at this point, but ayahuasca came in a dream and said, I have a message for you next time you journey with me. And then the message was stay in Ecuador. You're really weak. Like you need to recover. You need to heal. You need to get to your roots and let the tree actually grow from a real foundation. And so, yeah, in a lot of ways, she and this place and innumerable people along the journey have saved me from myself. And as you say, like it, it forces you, it brings you to your potential. And even if it brings you with your ego kicking and screaming, like has been the case for me. Everyone, I think, it <laughs> yeah. goes through that to some degree. Yeah, yeah to some degree. But I, I do have a pretty big ego and it's been a, a big challenge, but I have stuck with it. And I'm glad, I'm so glad I have. Like I love the guy in the mirror more than ever before. And I love the life that's blooming here. And yeah, a lot of people come here and they get spooked and they run away. Um, but it makes you face your stuff and that's so worthwhile. Cause like on the other side of your stuff is the actual expression of your soul and who you came here to be. Yeah, no, it's, it's really interesting. The, um, cause I have a similar, it's, you know, I had a similar experience in the sense of, 
in if you're if you're interested in looking at yourself, you know, and processing stuff and embodying as much as you can and sort of self-actualizing as much as you can and those kinds of things, you need space to do that. And you know, you sort of mentioned in the US that's harder. Like I agree, right? When you're kind of in the in the rat race, on the hamster wheel, or or just sort of in that kind of constant stimulus, constant stuff going on, it's hard to find that space. And then a place like this is really conducive to, you know, well, there's nothing really to do unless you want to do stuff. You know, mm -hmm. it's not like you have to get up and go to this and go to that and you got all these, right? I've kind of created that for myself, but you don't have to, right? Yeah. Um, you can, you know, you can also just kind of chill out in nature endlessly here if you yeah. want to, or yeah. you can be by yourself endlessly, or you can go into situations and groups or different things where other people who are in similar processes of looking at themselves are doing that and you can have those conversations and sort of share that and get feedback if you wanted and you know kind of be in that thing which which I think if you're on that path is really helpful because it's you know people aren't calling you crazy people aren't thinking what the hell is he talking about people kind of are also experiencing things that so it's I think that's different about this place than probably a lot of other you know a lot of other places yeah, hundred percent. It's beautiful. And like when you come from the perspective of the matrix, this was the case with me a little in the beginning, you judge it and you th you see the ecstatic dance and these people just being so free and <laughs> wild. And you're like, these people are really weird. Right. <laughs> like, oh yeah. These people are so vulnerable. I don't want to be like these people, but then <laughs> you, you connect with them as you want to, or you're alone. Like I spent a year very alone, pretty much just in this house. And then a year connecting with people and both are very valuable to get to know yourself and to see yourself mirrored in the external reflection of reality. And um, so, yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah, no, and this is a great spot to do that too. I mean, I don't know, unfortunately the center camera angle we didn't set up because we've got light behind us and we're in the shade so you couldn't see very well. So I don't know if these cameras are picking it up or not, but we've got Mondongo mountain here we could take one of them and pan absolutely um wow. yeah we'll get some shots and, and put it in regardless right behind us but you've got sort of a front and center in front of mondango you're only a few minutes from town but you're kind of in this very protected little valley that's kind of sort of a container with with mondango it's an interesting spot for you i think to yeah to go through some of that it's the it's been the perfect place. Yeah, I needed this protected place where in every direction I just see green, and uh, and yeah, all this space. I mean, it's a lot of space here, but yeah, I've needed that space like uh, to unpack everything, and then yeah, connecting with the energy of Mandango is just beautiful. So I'm yeah, I'm so grateful. I'm so what's grateful. Your, Abundant Living helped me find this. What's your uh, what's I'm curious. What's your because everyone has you know when you talk about Mandango, and I'll give a minute of. Uh, I'll give a minute of background. So, you know, the, the 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 legends and sort of the myth around Mondongo is that it's kind of this Incan protector of the valley type of thing, right? It's sort of this, I think, mostly male energy, right? It's sort of this male protector of Vilcabamba. It's very interesting looking. Like, it, it's it's not a mountain that looks like other mountains here, right? right? Very it's, distinct. It's distinct, yeah. Um, and then you've got, you know, the locals, like the taxi drivers and lots of locals and lots of foreigners as well, who kind of have this kind of view from all sorts of different angles of the mountain, will tell you that UFOs go in and out. And I don't know if you've seen stuff like that or not, but, um, but really a lot of, you know, very standard mainstream local people who don't have any, you know, wish to spread this. In fact, they're almost embarrassed talking about it, you know, will tell you lots of stories of lights going in and out and this and that and all that kind of stuff. Then you've got, you know, you've got these legends around, uh, I think it was Incan warriors would go up there to heal and stuff like that. Then you've got other people, you know, I know this, I know uh, a shaman, a uh, wonderful lady who, you know, really is able to connect to those kinds of energies and things like that, who, th who thinks it's sort of a very tricky energy. You know, it's kind of like one thing and another thing. And it's, it's kind of that kind of thing. You'll heal, you know, you'll, you'll have all kinds of different perspectives on that but what do you do you have like do you have thoughts on kind of what what is mondongo and what it means for you or for the valley or whatever does that does any of that stuff 
mean anything to you or? I mean, yeah, yes and no. Like I've heard those stories or similar stories. I said no when you mentioned UFOs. I haven't seen a flying saucer, but I have seen lights. I have looked out my window. My house is above where we are now, but it has a similar view. And I've looked out and I've seen flashing lights, um, lights then kind of traveling into my bedroom. And uh, yeah, a lot of weird stuff happens in this life. But yeah, I don't know, man. It's a mountain. It's a cool mountain. Yeah, right. Like, <laughs> right. I feel like I could pontificate about all this stuff, but it's a little bit like an ant speculating about what a human is. Right. Like, I, I imagine the mountains look at us and are just, you know, if they think of us at all, they're like amused, you know, by our very short lives and our very <laughs> small perspective. <laughs> but yeah, it's a, it's a powerful energy and I love feeling connected to it. I love seeing it every day. Um, my neighbor, Claudio Cañar, uh, he's my next door neighbor and he, he has lived here all his life. He says that Mandango is like the main spreader of positive energy through this valley. There's Guaranga, which is like the feminine mountain people say, which unfortunately got torched this past dry season, very sadly. Um, but yeah, I, this is just such a special place and definitely Mandango is a part of that. Mandango and Guaranga holding these two sides of the the dualistic vortex of Vilcabamba. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit, let's talk for a minute about, about the jungle. Um, you know, people, so Tena, which you mentioned, is further north, um, more north than south in Ecuador, but not anywhere near all the way north, uh, in the Amazonian region. Uh, some of those areas are known for, I mean, they have a decent, decent sized indigenous populations. I mean, all over the country, but certainly in the Amazonian region, that's pronounced a bit. So you'll have, you have more of that indigenous culture, history, um, et cetera, which of course includes shamanism, plant medicine, and that kind of stuff. This has really hit the mainstream over the last, I don't know how many years, five years, 10 years, whatever it is. Um, it's, turned into a whole sort of industry uh and i don't less so in ecuador than in peru and perhaps other places but i know you know there's whole towns in peru that basically their um their economy is is plant medicine tourism for better or worse i don't know i've never visited any of these towns um but i've also you know spent i've been to the jungle many times or not many times a few several times um, I've traveled up in that, you know, Puyo and Tena and Macas and all those areas. Um, beautiful, uh, totally different, right? Like humid and the way stuff grows is incredible. It's it's mm -hmm. another world of growth. It almost, what's that movie where uh, they go to, they, the journey to the center of the earth or something, they go into oh, another, an, you know. I've heard of this. I, yeah. Z something? I don't, I don't know, yeah. but but there's like, you know, there's 10 foot you know, stuff that should be a foot is, is tall is 10. It's kind of like that, you know. Or it's like a lost city. Um, Maybe not. So I'm thinking of, uh, you know, I don't want to get too far on a tangent, but it's actually a good movie. It's um, it's it's based on some of Jules Verne, Jules Verne, I think is his name, writing. And it has that actor in it who um, who played, I want to say like Men, Men, Mencino Man or something. Men, what's that guy's name? I don't know. I forget. Yeah. But A Journey to the Center of the Earth, it might be that. That might be the name of the movie. But okay. anyhow, um, right, so, so the Amazonian region, and it's interesting, right? So we're here in Vilcabamba. We're in what they call the Sierra, the, the mountains. Um, but we're 45 minutes or less or more, but in that, you know, approximately from the continental divide going south. And then if you go over that, you're in the Amazonian region. If you go east, you also hit the Amazonian region quickly. Um, even, I mean, you're looking... Well, the tree's blocking it a bit, but Podocarpus is, you know, right there. As you go over into Podocarpus and up and over, you get into the Amazonian region. The Amazonian region actually is, landmass-wise, is about is about 50% of the landmass in Ecuador, has 2% of the population in wow. Ecuador. So yeah, it's, wow. so yeah, so it's very sparsely populated, but there's some really cool towns, really cool culture, I think, in the Amazonian region. But for folks who are who are, you know, you've had obviously a lot of, it sounds like a decent amount of experience with plant medicine in Ecuador, in the Amazon, in the Amazon. for folks that are interested in that, because I'm sure, you know, people, uh, you know, m maybe they think it's demonic and want nothing to do with it, or maybe they think, maybe they're interested and want to check it out. And, you know, is that something, is that something you'd recommend? Is that, 
you know, how does that work here? Like, what were, what were your experiences or talk anything you want to say about that? Yeah, cool. Well, so I mentioned that dream where ayahuasca came to me and said, I have a message for you next time you journey with me. And the after that in the dream, I was like, should I journey with you? And there was no answer. And I don't think ayahuasca would ever say you should or should not um, connect with me because there's no should. It's a silly word, honestly. Um, I mean, all words are silly in a sense, but yeah, I don't believe in should or should not. I would never tell someone like you need to do ayahuasca. You don't need ayahuasca. I think that's something one has to feel for themselves internally. It's very much a calling. It's something like if you feel you're looking for this connection, for this deep reference experience of being one with nature, connected with God, connected with all, whatever you want to call it, ayahuasca is a very powerful way to have that experience. Um, but it is just that. It's just an experience. It doesn't do all the healing for you. It shows you how to heal yourself. It shows you what it is to be connected, to love yourself, to have that natural self-esteem where you don't even question being worthy of love. And then you have to go on your own and integrate that experience and, uh, and deal with your stuff on your own. So people have a lot of confused ideas about medicine. Oftentimes they think it'll do everything for you. It won't. But uh, yeah, it, it's one of the hundreds of things and people that saved my life, um, allowed me to be here, to see through the lies of the matrix, to change my life, to have the courage to build a new life, which is hard, like, because it feels like a big loss in a lot of ways. You mentioned like being in a city and having all this energy to do things. You do have that energy to do things because in a city, there's all this stimulation and things happening around you. So you are energized by that. But the question is, is it an energy that's actually aligned with your true self? You might just be selling insurance because it's what your parents think is a good career and you have all this energy to go get drunk on weekends but you're like totally disconnected from who you actually are so coming to a place like this reconnecting with nature can be like a big loss of all of this superficial energy but then a reconnection with your energy and that's i think the most powerful thing medicine provides it makes you more of you and it connects you with your energy it gives you a real feeling for what that is for who you are and then for me, the goal is to cultivate that without needing it, to cultivate it with meditation and to cultivate it in daily life and, and relationships and, uh, and not be too overly attached to any one thing. But, uh, but yeah, that was a big attachment and for good reason because it helped me a lot. I spent a total of more than three months in the jungle. There was one time two years ago where I was there for 45 days straight drank ayahuasca 20 times in those 45 days, did a lot of work also with liquid tobacco, and uh, <laughs> that was intense. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I feel it can be incredibly powerful, inspirational, connecting. I wouldn't say you should do it, but if you feel connected to this, if it's resonating, then yeah, big fan. And would you... Um... It's a it's a bit of a leading or loaded question because I'm I already know the answer but but I'll ask it anyway. Would you um would you say it matters tremendously who's the shaman who's preparing the environment is that stuff really important or it's like hey just just get it in you and you know yeah yeah thank you for the leading question because it reminds me of something I already wanted to say and forgot um, yes tremendously um, the set and setting are huge. The biggest thing is the energy you bring to the experience. Uh, and that's been empowering to realize because with regard to it being an industry and money sort of corrupting the motivations, that's actually something I experienced in the jungle with my shaman. And people in the jungle, often indigenous people, have a very different relationship with money. They don't have a lot of money and they don't know really how to save money oftentimes. They just, they have it, they spend it, they ask for more if they feel they have a way to get it. And so that's, that was a, a shadow of my work in the jungle. Um, but empowering to go through because I now feel if I do feel called to the medicine again, I could go to the jungle. I could work with my shaman and I am very comfortable having a boundary and being like, no, I'm not going to pay for your broken machine or whatever it is. Um, to yeah, be affirmed in myself and have that boundary and know that the energy I bring to the medicine is what's most important. But yeah, if you're looking for help, if you're looking for a shaman, there's a huge difference in different uh, medicine people, shamans, whatever you want to call them. 
I'm still sort of seeing how I feel about the paradigm of shamanism in general, like the idea of there being this special person who has the wisdom and doles out the wisdom to the other people. Mm -hmm. I think we need that paradigm now. We have needed that for some time based on where humanity is, but I envision a future where we're all connected to our inner shaman, our inner knowing, uh, our unity consciousness. So there's a little bit of a shadow just in calling someone a shaman and in saying, okay, you're the shaman, you must know. It's, it's disempowering in a sense. And medicine can be disempowering in a similar sense. Like it can affirm the sense of, oh, I'm sick, I'm so sick, I need medicine. And that can be disempowering and it can be poison if you let it be. But it's all about how you view it. And I would say the jungle compared to here, because there are a lot of medicine people here, mm -hmm. I'm drunk with people here. And the big difference is I would say the people here offering medicine, generally the intentions are pretty clean. They're not going to be trying to use you for money or use you to advance their shamanic career or whatever. Um, but I would also say they're less powerful. I would say that in the jungle, there's a lot more light and there's a lot more shadows. And uh, I like to say light and shadows a lot just because my docu-series is called Light and Shadows. And now that I'm working on that, I think of things often in terms of light and shadows because in anything and everything, there is both yeah. and each contains the other. But yeah, like... I've had experiences with my shaman in the jungle that were just invaluable as far as what he's able to see and what he's able to know. Like a few years ago, he was working on me, feeling, touching my leg and saying like, reconectarse or whatever, like reconnect, reconnect your leg. Yeah. And I had no understanding that my leg was disconnected. I knew that whenever I moved my leg, my knee would pop. It still does a little, but not audibly. It used to be very audibly because this was just splayed out and totally misaligned, which corresponds to misalignment that pretty much went up my whole body. But he was able to just know that. In a ceremony, he was able to feel what I was feeling, see what I'm seeing, um, deep knowing, deep power. And the people offering medicine here, they don't really have those gifts. So in the jungle, you're gonna find a shaman probably who has a lot more gifts, but um, be careful, take care, and remember always to trust yourself above anything outside because everything outside is reflecting yourself how much um how much do you concern yourself with safety living and traveling around ecuador um i try to minimize how concerned i am but i do prepare i mean there are a few cameras here i've been robbed here in this oh, place really? five or six times yeah what yep oh my i've gosh. had gas tanks taken it's usually petty stuff, petty stuff sure. so that's is a little um puts my mind at ease. Like I'm not particularly worried about getting murdered. Who knows? But uh, most of the, everything that's happened has been like fairly petty. One time this house was broken into and they took quite a lot of stuff. And so I'm, oh, wow. yeah, I'm trying to find neighbors and uh, do what I can. I have a dog, a German shepherd, who's like a killing machine and that makes me feel a little safer. Um, but yeah, I, like, I don't really brood about it. Most days I don't think about it, but it is, it is certainly something to be aware of. Yeah. No, it's, it's, that's gotten definitely been worse here in the last few years than it was. You, you know, uh, there was most of the years I've been here, you really didn't have to worry about that hardly at all. Not that there would never be a petty theft or something, but, but you weren't hearing frequently about, you know, people breaking in and taking a lot of stuff. It's definitely increased, you know, in the last, I'd say since COVID basically. Yeah. Um, which is definitely unfortunate. Of course, now we have, you know, there's all this stuff going on, which, uh, which we talk about on the channel incessantly, so I won't bother you with mm -hmm. that. But um, Seems but to be getting better, though. Seems to be getting better. I'm really, I'm personally really pleased with the government response. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's been a, it's like they're taking the problem seriously and actually taking it on, which, which is great. Right. Uh, in my opinion. Right. But, um, okay, and then what about what about the travel? Have you, in terms of as it relates to safety? Um, like, am I concerned with my safety traveling? Yeah, like, do you think about that? You know, you're going to the jungle, you're traveling around the country, whatever you're doing. Is that, like, how do you relate to safety? Is it even a concern at all? Or, or if so, in what way? Or? Safety is not a concern when I'm traveling. Um, I mean, I guess I, I do know I did hear of a guy who went on a bus and someone held up the bus and they got all their stuff taken, but that stuff seems pretty rare. Um, yeah, it doesn't personally concern me. The jungle, honestly, to me, feels to be the safest place. Yep. Um, this, in terms of material things, not the safest place, but I'm not super worried either. I mean, I think the robberies that I've suffered have been like young kids who see an opportunity to take some stuff. It's not like a deep 
deep worry of like getting shot up. Um, but like, honestly, I think you just have to look at the state of the world as a whole and, and recognize that reality has never been safe. Right. Like if right. you, if right. you look at, if you look at nature, it's just things killing things all the time, you know, <laughs> right. nature is savage. Right. And in the developed world, there's sort of like the developed world has created this little bubble that gives the veneer of safety and then obsesses over safety. Like during the COVID era, like safety is the most important thing. Safety is so important that we should stop living our lives in order to be safe. Right. <laughs> and it's just sort of a denial of nature and of reality because it's not safe. Like things happen, life happens, and you just got to make peace with that. And I think this is a good place to make peace with that. In the material sense, yeah, I would feel safer in the U.S., but energetically, it's the U.S. is so dangerous. Like, I would only go there for a few weeks at this point. I'm so sensitive. And when I have gone there, like the last time I was there was almost two years ago. And my body just viscerally rejected it. I had night sweats. I was crying all the time. I'm a very sensitive person, so this wouldn't be everyone. But mm -hmm. um, energetically, it was totally unsafe. And so based on my values, this is the safer place, even if I'm more likely to have, you know, a, a gas tank stolen. Um I'm more likely to be connected to myself and for my energy to be good here. And that's what matters. And, uh, and the jungle, I think, is the safest place. Like, there are dark energies, but I've been through enough that I'm not really worried about those. And, yeah, no one's, like, going to the jungle marauding and, like, stealing everything with guns. Like, that's just not right. happening. So, to me, that feels like the safest place. And this feels like the next safest place. And I feel safer holistically here than I would in a developed country. Mm-hmm. So, you know, maybe you've kind of covered this a bit already, but, um, you know, if you want to give any more depth. So, so you're obviously somebody who's, you know, sort of seeking, right? You're seeking, uh, at the end of the day, I guess it's yourself, right? It's sort of self-discovery, hmm. um, uh, you know, it's sort of processing the things that you feel like you need to process in order to whatever in order to evolve in order to have the life you want in order to be the person you want or to feel you know how you could define those any way you want but and so you've come to Vilcabamba I guess in part sort of for that um and you mentioned also uh connecting with nature the food um sort of sort of I, I would describe it maybe as just kind of a back to a more con connected sort of natural you know way of living um has has and, and has has Vilcabamba served that? Is that is this a place that you feel like, you know, what do you like? How did you relate this place to those goals for you? Yeah, I mean, totally in alignment with those goals. Vilcabamba has absolutely served what was seeking and actually transformed it into something that I would say is not actually seeking so much now. Mm -hmm. I like my life. I love my life. I love my friends. I love where I live. I love my work, which I'm getting more and more into. And I'm only really seeking one thing. What I'm seeking is to make my work great. It's that pursuit of excellence to make Light and Shadows uh, a powerful vehicle to share this place, to expand the energy we're cultivating here, and uh, to make that as successful as possible. That's really the only thing I'm seeking with regard to transcendent peak experiences, women, money, material success. With regard to anything I might have sought in the past, it's really fallen away. And like the energy is flowing in my body very naturally now. I feel whole, I feel complete. I'm not totally there, like I have wounds for sure and I'm still working, but I've made a turn to like, I don't actually need anything outside of myself. And what I do need comes, like what I do need comes. Life is a psychedelic journey and it's always yeah. giving us exactly what we need. So I trust life and this place has helped me trust life enough to drop all of the seeking that isn't essential to where all I seek is my purpose. And I feel my purpose is to sort of be like an expander of the energy here, to take the energy here with respect because like the extractivism or taking of filming of, you know, trying to, to bring something from sacred spaces is always a very delicate balance. But to do that in that delicate way show it to the world and um, and be a bridge from here to the world and in, like allow this place to inspire because I think what we're creating here is a possibility. And if I can help people see that possibility, then, you know, this is not the only Bethlehem of the new earth. This is a bright light. But, you know, as 
the day of the world we were living in turns into night, I view this as a bright star and there are gonna be a lot of stars in the night sky. And by showing this star and making it visible, I hope to empower people all around the world to, uh, to shine as well. Um, let's talk a little about, about the project. Do you wanna give people some information on that? Yeah, I hope I haven't been like inject interjecting it too much already. No, not at all. Um, I've already touched on a lot of it, but yeah, it's called Light and Shadows. It's a little bit cross genre. It's a documentary series telling the story of this place. It's a reality series, you know, with me being a character, with the people on the team being a characters, being characters. Um, yeah, the team is seven and growing. And so we're basically showing our lives in the hopes of showing that possibility, showing the light and then also showing the shadows. And that's where it goes into a genre almost of investigative journalism, because as I've connected with people and started doing this work, I've heard wilder and wilder stories about the origins of this place. Uh, Johnny Love Wisdom, yeah. the guy who came yeah. in the 60s with his followers and then was found dead in a room with no food or water. Right. Questions about how that happened. Yep. Many rumors. The rumor mill here is ridiculous. If you yeah. want to talk about cons of Bill Cabamba. Totally. Um, so that's why it's called Light and Shadows, because this is a place that is very bright, but not without shadows. I think the brighter the light, the deeper the shadows often. And so I wanna just show that reality, show that reality of a new way of life being co-created by all of us here, and then show the challenges that come, maybe challenges that come from outside. Like I imagine there might come a day where governments aren't a huge fan of us creating a way of life that is sovereign and doesn't need the government. And so in that sense, like, you know, I think what the cartels have been doing is awful. Don't get me wrong. But in that sense, like, I'm not necessarily like, yeah, government crush the rebels because I'm a rebel. I mm -hmm. want to co-create a reality that's free. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I think we'll face internal challenges, shadows and work and external challenges, shadows and work. And I want to share all of that and uh, share what's possible so that people know what's possible and feel empowered that they decide their lives. That's the mission, show people that they decide their lives. And that's where I think seeking is appropriate. That's why you need that energy of deciding what your life is gonna be. And if you're in a city disconnected from things, stuck in a job, you just feel stuck, you feel like disempowered. This is a place that can show you your power to recreate your world and your life and make your life what you want it to be. And I think on the whole, the light will will shine beyond the shadows as we create this world of freedom, of harmony, of connection, of accepting each other, not judging each other, loving each other. Like I, I love the people here in this community just very unconditionally, um, accepting them all as a part of myself and uh, yeah, co-creating all the biodiversity and the sovereignty and the liberation that I think we're co-creating. Yep. Who, uh, is there anybody that you would say, it's opinion, of course, but is there anyone that, from your perspective, Bill Cabamba is not for? <laughs> yeah, a lot of people, yeah. most people. Right. Um, yeah, it's very common for people to come here and just hate it and be very quickly repelled. <sighs> anyone who isn't ready to do the heavy lifting and the hard work of becoming their real selves, like, it's still a lot of work for me, and I think for you, uh, even having been doing this for two and a half years and for what, a decade? Plus, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's so much ego. There's so many layers. Oh, yeah. Never there's ends. So, so much never stuff. Ends. I told you, like, in my early days with ayahuasca, my first eight ceremonies, I never purged. And I right. thought, oh, maybe it means I'm just a bright light with no issues. And no, like, there, there's a lot to unpack. And now I've drunk 57 times and purged, you know, probably at least 30 of those times. And uh, there's so much to let go of and it's really hard. Like, it's important for people to understand that it's hard. It's challenging to face yourself and to, to go from a world that is like essentially upside down, like straight up, upside down, um, not straight up, upside down. But yeah, that's like what the matrix is. Everything inverted, just living in a sea of lies that's so deep, it's hard to even fathom or apprehend when you're in it, but then you come out of it and you start recognizing it and not only recognizing it outside, but recognizing it in yourself and realizing like, you know, my first year here when I was alone, like I was watching 
the descent of the matrix i was going on info wars and seeing like right. what bullshit is sorry no, what good. what crap is happening today and uh and realizing like that is something in myself that is a connection to this darkness we were in the matrix but the matrix is in us mm -hmm. and it takes a long time and a lot of work and relentless authenticity and vulnerability and willingness to step into uncomfortable feelings in order to unpack all of that so for anyone who isn't up for that big challenge it's this place is not for you yeah i mean i just have to say on a personal level your your capacity for authenticity and vulnerability is really commendable mm -hmm. you know uh that's not easy I, I, to get to that place you know a lot of people will see this and they won't like your opinions and they'll crit be critical and all that which is completely fine everybody has their yeah you know their thoughts i already get it from hundreds of thousands of people on twitter on twitter X, yeah it's fine but but regardless you know of what you of what anyone thinks about someone else's journey or someone else's opinions or experiences i think it's really commendable to get to a point in your life where you have the capability and the capacity you know to sit and be and express your authentic self and and be vulnerable so you know, I just, on a personal level, I just want to commend you for that. Um, yeah. Um, all right. Is there, is there other stuff that I haven't brought up that you want to talk about? Hmm. Nothing is springing to mind. Okay. Any, um, for folks out there who are watching this, obviously this is a channel focused around the Loja Vilcabamba region of Ecuador. Um, most of the people watching it are people considering Ecuador as an option. Uh, anything you would say to them, any tips, advice, do's and don'ts, or just overall thoughts that uh, you want to give people? Sure, yeah. I mean, I feel it's very important to be aware of your why, what's bringing you to Ecuador. Sometimes I've like questioned my decision a little bit based on the fact that I came here in, in ways like out of fear. Like I was going away from the matrix as i call it even though you know it's not like the matrix is the us and this isn't the no, matrix no. like the matrix is here too but i would say those forces we're talking about when we say the matrix the dark forces in the world are a lot stronger in developed countries and so people feeling that and wanting to leave that i feel that's very valid but just to be clear on why you're coming here and uh i also feel it's important to to be receptive here and to get to know the place like i'm absolutely guilty of what i'm about to describe but i think probably a lot of people who come here from say the us they bring a lot with them and it's not all pleasant things and i feel the people here the ecuadorians are incredibly commendable for their acceptance and how they just see all of these wild hippies coming in their town a town which is like half people from other countries which I think there's some sociological thing that like anything over X percent feels energetically like an invasion and it X is a lot lower than 50. So it's almost like an invasion here. And we're bringing this new culture, these new energies, and I'm incredibly grateful to the Ecuadorian people for just the acceptance that I found here. And so I think we do, and I'm not like a big social justice warrior guy who, you know, is on a soapbox of like, white people are bad or anything like that right. by no means. But I think it's important to be aware of what we're bringing here and to connect with the people here and to be receptive and sensitive, like especially having been on TV and had good experiences and being from a lot of privilege, like it would have been really easy for me to just coast through life in the US and not reflect on myself and just naturally sit on the top of a lot of social hierarchies and be ignorant. And coming here and not knowing the language and not knowing the culture and being nothing, in a sense, has taught me a lot of humility and sensitivity and taught me the importance of seeing how things are here and, and not assuming I know. Because I came here with a lot of ideas of what I wanted to create, and I still have a lot of ideas of what I want to create, but now I'm actually ready to do that. Whereas when I first came, I wasn't ready at all because I wasn't sensitive and receptive and appreciating the culture here and working with it. And I know you've really become able to work with it and understand the culture over all your time here. So I think, yeah, patience and uh, understanding why you're coming and then integrating why you're coming with what's here and having that respect for what's here. Those are, um, yeah, that's, that's very well said and excellent advice. Since you brought it up, what, give me the summary version um, of 
What is the Ecuadorian culture all about? Mm, yeah. Well, I'm not the guy to answer that. Well, of course. But, you're, you know, your, I, your perception. Of course. And yeah. it is more of a perception than I had when I first came. I think it was a big learning in general just about how different cultures are. Like, I traveled a lot before I moved here. I'd been to probably 40 countries. Oh, wow. And, yeah, spent, you know, a few weeks here, a few weeks there, maybe a month or two in another country. But being here for so long taught me that it really takes a long time to understand another culture. And when I was traveling to all those places, I wasn't really understanding the culture. You know, I was going and having touristic experiences, and I was walking around, like, almost with an energy of conquering experiences or collecting things, collecting Pokemon cards of like, I've hiked <laughs> the Himalayas, I've done this, right. I've done that. And coming here, you know- that, Take, Taking a trip for the gram. <laughs> exactly, yes, yes. Right. I mean, that's a culture that's just everywhere in the world now as mm -hmm. the gram and as technology have colonized the world. And so coming here, a lot of the humility and the learning was just, it takes a long time to get to know the culture. So I'm still learning. And I guess that's all just preamble to say there's a lot still to learn, but uh, I would frame it largely in terms of like the prophecy of the eagle and the condor. You know that story, I'm mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. So humanity diverged. There was a path of the condor, which is kind of the people here, very connected to the heart, very uh, grounded, very real. And then there's the path of the eagle, the path of the mind, very active, a lot of doing. I think the eagle people like us coming here have a lot to offer and a lot to share. It's not like we need to just come and be Ecuadorian and not share our gifts. Like we have a lot of ability to do things, which is something I respect a lot about you. Like you're one of the few people in this valley who came here and appreciates the culture here, but also wants to, to do things and bring that energy of getting things done, which is very important. And that's what I'm coming into as well. But I think here there's a lot, you know, we might have, ideas of what to do. And people here, I think, have a lot to teach us about how to be. Right. Like, that's very well said. And I was going to go on because you asked no, me No, please about the go culture. on. I just wanted to say that's well said. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. Um, it takes time to realize it. I think for a lot of people from the U.S., you know, it takes having like 500 experiences of going and meeting an Ecuadorian and being like, hey, how's it going? You know, <laughs> and coming in with that energy. And then they're just like, hey. Hola. And they're like, what did I do wrong? What's, and then they slowly, you know, realize the energy they're bringing and they realize a lot about how to be. And people here are very connected to their being, to their heart, to each other, yeah. to the land. It's a very agricultural place. And I, I don't believe in the distinction of natural versus not natural, but insofar as we use words to make that distinction, the culture here is natural. People are relaxed. They're in the moment. Mm -hmm. the, the downside of that is if you make a plan, the plan might not happen. Mm -hmm. People might not show up on time. It's hard to get things done. Yep. Um, but yeah, like the first time I called and was trying to arrange logistics, like shipping things here, and the woman answered, I just heard her voice and I felt so good. I felt like people here are really connected and really real and really kind. And I think that's the part of the culture that has won me over the most. There's also the the lack of timeliness. You know, it's this trade-off between like business, not so good here, getting things done, um, but then being in the moment, being natural, um, being relaxed, just showing up as you are. Like this place has really cured my social anxiety, whereas before I, I would have like all this mental stuff going on about showing a face and presenting what I wanted to present to someone here. People are really just show up as they are and that's something of the culture that I've integrated and I'm so grateful for. So yeah, the culture's connected, present, but not always planning, um, real, natural, kind. Um, also, like I hope with my work and with my presence here to help Ecuadorians see the magic here because I see a lot of Ecuadorians with a New York hat or a California shirt and like they view progress as it's been defined through Hollywood and these neo-colonialist energies in the US and they think that's the way forward. And to me, it's tragic because like, yeah. yeah, our economy is gargantuanly bigger. I mean, I shouldn't say our, the US economy is gargantuanly bigger than our economy here in Ecuador, but the real economy, the real wealth, the natural abundance, the earth, which you can't put a price on, that's all here. 
And so, yeah, Ecuadorians are very humble. The culture is very humble, also like a lot of limiting beliefs. And I feel like the turn that I hope to see is people recognizing how great this place is, having some pride in that and, uh, and sharing that. Um, is there anywhere or anything you either want to point people towards or shout out, or is there anything you're looking for? Is there anything that you want to mention to folks that they can check out, links, places, names, anything you want to talk about? Yeah, ryman.substack.com, R-E-I-M-A-N.substack.com. That is what I'm seeking, as many followers as possible. No. <laughs> I'm seeking uh, people who connect with me and resonate with what I'm saying to go there and to see what I write, what I say, and soon the documentary series, reality series, video content that I put out there. Yeah. Well, Ryman, I really appreciate uh, not only your time, but your, you know, you, you've given, I think, some really actually very profound uh, commentary, insight, answers. So I appreciate that. Don't blow up that USC um, going. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and I'll just say for I'll just say you know one thing before we wrap. Um, and I, I usually don't get into a lot of this stuff on the channel, but I, I will say it here. The for me, um, the you know I think you described it maybe as the promise, or, or maybe used a different word, but sort of the promise of what could be created in this particular location on Earth. Um, is really cool. It's really inspiring for me. Um, as I sort of see it, you know, I see all of these people who have very different, in many cases, ideas and belief systems and thoughts, and but have this commonality of having a very high vision for what life can be, Earth can be, what they can be, um, what you know what that what sort of life on earth could look like and Everyone and when I say everyone I don't mean every member of the that you know I don't mean every person that lives in Vilcabamba, but I mean a large enough chunk of them that I'll use the word everyone uh, that everyone Sort of brings their piece or their role or their skill set or their whatever and it's been it's quite amazing for me to sort of see how people who seem to have sort of destinies together or life missions together or things like that tend to find each other in Vilcabamba. And there's kind of this like bubbling undercurrent of what could be a really beautiful thing, you know, as we, as we go into the future. It's, it's definitely one of the things that attracted me here. I do see it happening. It doesn't mean there's not negativity. It doesn't mean there's not problems. It doesn't mean you know that that uh, all the normal challenges you have anywhere in the world don't doesn't don't exist, and so on and so forth. But there's a crew here. You know, there's like a group of a, a large number of of people who seem to be called here, and in one way or the other are m informally, but in one way or the other are kind of working together to create this and create that and put this together and create this network or this project or this idea. Um, and it's, you know, it's one of the things that keeps me here and inspires me and is sort of, you know, I'm almost just sort of grateful to be part of in a certain way. And like, it's, it's cool. So I, I very much agree with that. And, um, I think it is one of the unique and beautiful things about this community and about Vilcabamba in general. So unless you got something else, I'll leave it there. Guys, thank you for tuning in. Appreciate it. Uh, again, hit the like button if you enjoyed this. Um, we'll put Ry the link as well um, that Ryman mentioned in the description below. So if you want to check that out, uh, please do. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. If you're interested in real estate properties, all of our property videos will now be uploaded on a different channel. Please click the link in the description down below.